Just a moment. Так, я включил запись. Друзья, это означает, что мы начинаем э, наш вебинар. Э, я э, прошу всех, э, кто кроме организатора и кроме выступающего Анна Шаковича выключить, выключить э, микрофоны. Видеокамеры можно не выключать, а вы, микрофоны прошу выключить, потому что по опыту мы знаем, что посторонние звуки сильно мешают. Сегодня, 24 февраля 2021 года, 16 часов 6 минут московского времени, присутствует 30 человек. Это большое количество. Я знаю, дальше по ходу вебинара подключится еще кто-то. Вот уже 31 подключается. И это по-английски называется full house. Мы называем это а, этот антракт или как там аншлаг, извините. А англичане называют это full house. Аншлаг это, видимо, немецкое слово. Сегодня у нас доклад Андра Шаковича. Он вообще-то венгер, но он сейчас работает в Андрош, там, в Хельсинки. В Хельсинки. Он сейчас работает в Хельсинки. Вот. Ну и это он выпустил книгу, и эта книга сейчас находится в печати. И вот это большая честь для нас сегодня услышать некоторые фрагменты из этой книги, о которых нам расскажет Андрош. Ну, вот на первый взгляд, вот тут я уже об этом написал в своем комментарии к объявлению и к семинару, но он... Мария, may I ask you to switch off your microphone? My microphone. Mario. Мария, I talk to you. Я тогда сам выключу. Да, но ну, возвращаюсь вот к, к, к введению. Итак, почему сегодняшний доклад важен для нас? Э, важен для нас? Потому что, э, ну, я это объяснял в своих вот, как, в каком-то комментарии к объявлению о семинаре, но еще пару слов скажу. Вот пять лет назад, всего пять лет назад, я э, выступал в Ифтане по теме вот, сверхединичных устройств. И высказал предположение, что формула Джоули Ленца неверна. Или, по крайней мере, в наших условиях она не работает. Это вызвало такой ужас у присутствующих. Я просто его хорошо помню. Как же так? Этого не может быть. А я напомню, что эта формула 180 лет назад была придумана. 280 сейчас. 1840-1940. Да, 180 лет назад была придумана Джоулем и через год переоткрыта Ленцем. И опираться только на какие-то вот затвержденные в каких-то стандартных книжках 40, 50, 60 лет назад истины в новой физике, которой мы занимаемся, видимо, не стоит. Это одна из причин, по которым сегодняшний доклад, это, он очень важен. Кроме того, я бы хотел обратить внимание вот всех, кто строит экспериментаторов, кто строит свои теоретические модели, обратить внимание на, ну, это уровень не самый высший уровень теоретической физики, который мы сегодня послушаем, но все-таки опора на математику довольно сложную и опора на уже известные математические следствия известных теорий, она очень важна. Поэтому, пожалуйста, вот учитесь, как нужно строить новые теории. Ну, у нас такие люди тоже есть, и они присутствуют сегодня на нашем вебинаре, которые тоже строят свои довольно сложные математические теории. Но они чуть попозже, после Андреша, выскажутся. Итак, сегодня Maxwell's Equations and Occam's Razor by Andres Kovac. Andres, take the floor, uh, your presentation. Uh, uh, switch on uh, demonstration of your screen. Uh, 
Okay, okay, I, I start. Uh, I, it says you have to give me the access, right? It says uh, host I, disabled I, 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 sharing. I, I gave you permission. Okay, now it works. Try, yes. try, try please again, once again. Yes, okay. Uh, yes, we, we see we see your presentation. Okay, do you see now the full screen? Full screen. You switch on full full screen. Okay, okay, great. So so this is the uh, title of my presentation, Maxwell's equations and Occam's razor. Uh, and this presentation is based on the ideas that we have in the uh, second edition of our book. And uh, here you see the authors that collaborated. Uh, so Giorgio Vassallo, Paul O'Hara, Antonino Di Tommaso, Francesco Celani, and myself. So maybe you know uh, some of them. Uh, what I would like to uh, say in the beginning is that uh, many of the ideas are in the second edition, but today you can only buy the first edition because Andres, we are still Andres, Andres, discussing. Yes? Andres, just a moment, Andres. I, I wanted to remind you that I ask you to, to tell clear and slow. Oh, okay. Now That's you are talking important. clear, but a little bit slow. It's okay. Or, or, okay, or, so or, I slow down. Oral comprehension in, in Russian, uh, Russian auditorium is oh. very, very bad. Please slow. Thank okay. you. Okay, thank you for a reminder. So, so this uh, uh, book, uh, now you can buy first edition and we discuss with the publisher about second edition. So much of what I present today is in the second edition and please be patient a few months and after a few months it will be available. Uh, okay, so this is the content of my presentation. First I discuss methodology. In the book we use the and mathematics of Clifford algebra. So I will talk a little bit about that. Uh, then we discuss, start from fundamentals, discuss about Maxwell's equation and the problem of gauges. And then we will apply uh, this to describe the electron. And we will uh, try to understand better what is electric charge, what is the tergivable. And then we'll make a uh, sense of what the electrons charge radius and quantum radius physically mean. We uh, will uh, review what it means that uh, the electron's mass may be electromagnetic field energy. And then we discuss relativistic transformations. And we will apply this theory to calculate the anomalous magnetic moment. Now I will say a few words about charge quantization and the mathematical symmetries of electromagnetism. And after this uh, foundation, we will get to the topic that I think is interesting for many in the audience to describe neutrino as an electromagnetic wave. That will be the last part of my presentation. Uh, okay, let's uh, start from the methodology. Uh, so here you can see the cover of our book. And so the title is Maxwell Dirac Theory and Occam's Razor. So this uh, word Occam's Razor, it is in our title, uh, what it means. Uh, here, uh, I wrote down Occam's Razor principle. It means that among different models that fit experimental data, the simplest one must be preferred. So it means that as a physicist, we have to look at the simplest possible way to describe nature and avoid any unnecessary complications. And if we do that, then probably we are doing something correct. And this uh, is a very old principle. It was formulated by Ptolemy uh, almost 2000 years ago. And uh, today it is still a very valuable principle. Uh, many people forgot to use it, but we would like to get back, I think, to using it. The second important principle in our work is that we use uh, consistently electromagnetism and general relativity at all length scales. So, so what it means, it means that we don't say that uh, Maxwell's equation is only valid here, but not valid here. If you have an equation that you think describes nature, 
it is describing it everywhere. Whether you look at large distance or short distance, uh, nobody will magically turn off Maxwell's equation. So we believe that it is um, uh, valid at all the length scales. <clears throat> so I give you a simple example uh, that uh, as we know already in high school, uh, we can calculate electromagnetic energy from taking square of electric field divided by two. Uh, this is electromagnetic energy density. Now, if we take this seriously, it means we cannot work with point charges. Because if you would have a mathematical point charge, uh, electric field would go to infinite as you go very close to the point charge. And uh, <clears throat> then it would give you infinite energy density and infinite energy. And this is in physics, the renormalization problem. So we don't want to uh, forget infinities. Uh, we, we then right away say that, okay, we cannot work with point charges because that would be infinite uh, energy. So we have to look at some more uh, realistic model of nature. <clears throat> uh, and actually the same goes for um, uh, general relativity. When we learn at university general relativity, then we usually learn that it applies only at the very big cosmic scales. But this is not what Einstein said. He didn't say that general relativity applies only at cosmic scales. The equation of general relativity, uh, they uh, simply say that if you have energy density, that energy density is curving space time. The more energy density you have, the more space time curvature you have. And uh, of course, you can apply it to the microscopic world as well. So, this is in fact illustrated in our cover that what you see as a quantum mechanical wave, uh, in fact, uh, uh, in reality, you can also calculate what is the space time curvature of the electric fields close to the nucleus. And uh, to get a consistent view of electromagnetism uh, and uh, quantum mechanics, we must not forget that general relativity also applies on the microscopic scales, not only on the macroscopic scales. So, so we want to be very consistent in how we use uh, physical equations. This is our methodology. Okay, now let's start with the mathematics that we will use. <clears throat> so maybe some of you learned Clifford algebra in school, maybe it's new for some of you. For me, I only learned it in the past few years. It was not part of my university education, but um, it's actually not very complicated. So the basic rule uh, in Clifford algebra is that you have these multiplication rules of basis elements. A basis element is like a unit vector in certain directions. So you can see that if you have a base vector in the X, Y, or Z direction, then you multiply it by itself, you get one. If you multiply the time direction by itself, then the square of the time basis vector is minus one. And you can also multiply different basis vectors, for example, X and Y. And here the rule is, is that if you multiply basis vector I and J, it's minus the J and I. So switching the order gives a minus sign. And uh, these are the basic rules of Clifford algebra. And you can see why it's useful in physics because from the first line, you can recognize that this is uh, basically giving you the metric of Minkowski space. This is our uh, uh, space time uh, metric so that you can see that Clifford algebra basically captures the geometry of uh, space time. So it's not a surprise that this will be very uh, useful in physics. Uh, so what also you uh, please remember is that when you multiply different direction basis vectors, for example, X and Y, then you have this E X Y that you can think of as an area element. So here the area elements, we call a pi vector. So pi vector, just think of an as an oriented area element. Similarly, you can think of a tri-vector. A tri-vector is a 
volume oriented volume element. So you can have multiple dimensions. You can have vectors, B vectors for area and three vectors for volume. Okay, now the rules that we saw in the past slides, previous slide, we can apply to multiply two space-time vectors. So, so here I use this notation to write a space-time vector. The first element is the time component with a T index. The second uh, bold is the, is the spatial direction. So it's like a space vector. Okay, so this space vector has X, Y, and Z components. So now let's uh, look how the product of the two vectors is. And if you write P and Q, I write here in terms of the space and time components, sorry, the time and space components, and Q also, time and space components. And we simply apply the rules in the previous slide to multiply out these different basis components. So again, uh, to go back to previous slide, I only apply these first and second line. These are the only rules I apply. And if you do this multiplication, then this is the result you get for multiplying two space-time vectors. You get this first part, which looks like a dot product. So this uh, dot product is the scalar part. And <clears throat> This gives you a scalar. So here, for example, you have the time components multiplied and here you have the space components multiplied. And this uh, scalar part is a number and this is symmetric. Symmetric meaning if you exchange P and Q, you get the same. And then you have the other part. This is the P vector part. So here you can see that it's similar to a cross product that we learned in the school. So the spatial part is a cross product and you have a similar construction in the uh, time component. So physicists uh, uh, denote the second part with the wedge product. So when you see the wedge product, you can think of uh, this uh, expression on the top. And this is somehow uh, similar to the uh, cross product that we learn in school, but applied to a space time vectors. And uh, in terms of dimensionality, this is a B vector, so like an area element, and this is anti-symmetric. Anti-symmetric means that you change P and Q, you get a minus sign. Okay, so this is important to remember that in Clifford algebra, if we multiply two space-time vectors, we get the symmetric part, which is scalar, and the anti-symmetric part that is uh, written with a wedge product, and this is a, a B vector. Also, we can define the so-called unit pseudoscalar, and we uh, use the letter I for it. So this is just multiplying the time X, Y, and Z base products. And uh, the reason why we choose I is because it has some similarity with the imaginary unit in complex numbers. So in complex numbers, if you multiply I by itself, you get minus one. And this is also true here, that if you multiply this I by itself, you also get minus one. It follows from the rules I uh, wrote in previous slide. But, uh, but please remember that this is not a complex value. It just has similar properties but this is, uh, in the end, a geometric construction that uh, has the dimensions of time and space. And uh, that's why it's called a pseudoscalar because it behaves like a scalar, but this is not a scalar. So this is a geometric construction. Uh, now, with this uh, definition, uh, we can, uh, write also this uh, sigma that's uh, like the gradient in space-time. So when we use in the following slides, this bold sigma, 
then the broad signal means that we have the space time gradient plus the change in time. And we use multiply that by one over C just to normalize uh, the uh, scale of space and time. Okay, so this is uh, our basic overview of the Clifford algebra mathematics. Do you have any question so far about Clifford algebra? Вопросы у кого-нибудь есть по, по, по алгебре Клиффорда? Okay, then no let's go questions. on. Continue, please. Okay, let's go on. And now we will uh, apply this uh, to describe Maxwell's equation. So, so in Maxwell's equation, uh, we learn at university that there is a vector potential field. And this vector potential, we use the letter A to denote. And the, this four index, this square index means that this has four components. So this is a space-time vector. A is a space-time vector with four uh, components. And we apply this uh, space-time gradient sigma that we defined in the previous uh, slide. So we apply it and we use the Clifford algebra multiplication rules. So we have the first term with a dot product. This is the symmetric term. And then we have the second term with a wedge product. The, the first term with a dot product, we use S to denote it. And the second term, uh, we use the letter F. Uh, and F, uh, you will see, is the electric and magnetic, uh, contains electric and magnetic fields. And together, we use the symbol G to denote the S and the F. But uh, nevertheless, please remember that they have different dimensions. S has a scalar dimension and F has a B vector dimension, but we can combine the two in this uh, letter G. Uh, okay, so, <clears throat> so with the Clifford algebra, uh, this uh, Maxwell equation looks quite simple. You just apply the space-time gradient to the vector potential and you get the electromagnetic fields. Now, the question is, uh, uh, what is the traditional understanding of these symbols? And here, traditional means over the past 100 years. So the traditional view of physicists over the past 100 years has been that we declare S, the scalar part to be zero, and this has a name, this is called the Lorentz gauge. So when you read Lorentz gauge, it just means that you, you set S to be zero. And regarding this F construction, which I wrote as E with a gamma T plus IB with a gamma T, uh, I wrote this with a proper multiplication in Clifford algebra. And the standard view of physicists is that we can treat this as a complex number. So you have surely seen this E plus IB expression for uh, the circularly polarized electromagnetic wave. So normally physicists treat it as a complex number, but we want to treat it properly as a geometric uh, construction. Uh, okay, now <clears throat> the question is, uh, why did physicists decide that uh, S can be set to zero? And this is, was based on the philosophy of how Maxwell's equation was viewed. So first, physicists started with charges. And the idea was that there is some constellation of charges in space. And then from charges, uh, they wanted to derive the vector potential field. And there is a formula called the leonard wiechert potential formula that takes the uh, uh, relativistic constraints uh, of the uh, retardation into account and generates vector potential from charges. Then once physicists had the vector potential, they just wanted to take a space-time derivative to get electromagnetic field. And because they wanted to have electromagnetic field at the output, they, they did not want any scalar part. The idea was you start from charges, you get vector potential, and from vector potential, you get electromagnetic field. And uh, 
this seemed to fit well with the experiment to just say that scalar part is zero and then uh, the calculation seemed to match uh, what was measured in terms of the radio wave propagation. So this was the philosophy, but uh, what's wrong? What's wrong with this traditional approach? There are several problems. <clears throat> Firstly, uh, with this traditional approach, charges are external object. You put in by hand because you start with a constellation of charges as your starting point, and you put them in by hand into Maxwell equation. And this way, the physics does not explain what charges are made of. You don't, you don't know anything about charges, what they are. So because uh, physicists uh, don't know what charges are made of, uh, they assume that let's make charges a point like particles. Because if they would be extended, you would have to say, okay, if you have an extended object, you have to say, what is the material? What is the object made of? Because they did not want to answer the question, what are charges made of? They said, let's just make them as abstract points and forget the question of what they are made of. But of course, if you, if you make them abstract points, you have this renormalization problem coming in because abstract charge point has an infinitely high electromagnetic energy because all the fields get infinite close to the point. So, so this is really not a proper procedure. <clears throat> the other problem is that because we put in charges by hand, it remains unclear how charges couple to electromagnetic forces. And the mainstream perspective, I think, is an outdated view that uh, the view is that if I have two charges, they continue actually, continuously exchange photons between them, like a ping pong ball game of photons. And the photons are the force carrying particles. So to me, this is somehow very odd view that you have these charges and they play a ping pong game and the force is like the result of a ping pong game. I think we can do more proper field theory than this uh, ping pong theory. And third and most important for us, <clears throat> the actually applying the Lorentz gauge leads to contradictions and therefore contradictions tell us it cannot be correct. Here I give a reference of an article. I cannot go through all the details, but in this article, the author uh, gives very clear examples that show that if you apply gauge theory to electromagnetism, then uh, you have uh, physical contradictions and therefore something is wrong. Okay, so if you have these problems, then let's think how to solve the problem. And because we want to use uh, the simplest way possible, then our proposition is that the simplest possible solution to these problems is to start from vector potential field and take this as a starting point and use the procedure we had before. And from vector potential field, we use space-time derivative, same as before, and the result should give us both fields and charges. So the, so the only difference with respect to classical approach is that we don't set S to be zero, but we say that actually S has a physical meaning. The scalar field is the uh, corresponding to the charges. So if we set S to zero, it's like erasing charges from Maxwell's equations. But uh, if we just keep S as a real physical object, then we have a, a field which uh, describes the charges. And uh, in this way, Maxwell's equation can be written very simple way with Clifford algebra. You just say that sigma g uh, is zero. And if you start from g, and if you start from the vector potential, you say that sigma square a is zero. So this is uh, looks very simple and efficient. So we like simple and efficient. So let's uh, try to see if this is actually the proper way to understand Maxwell's equation. Now, most importantly for our discussion, <clears throat> this uh, way of looking at Maxwell's equation 
it answers the question of what charges are made of. So electric charges are nothing else but a certain type of electromagnetic field. And once you recognize it, then electromagnetism can be formulated as a proper field theory. So we believe that this is the uh, proper starting point to develop electromagnetic uh, field theory, which uh, is really what physicists are after. Okay, um, now, I, if can, we... I, can, I, can, can I interrupt you that, yes. that, that, that moment? And uh, please uh, switch on previous slide. Previous, okay. previous. Uh, you never uh, show us during your presentation uh, 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 the scalar part, scalar part of uh, this expression charges. Could you, in words now, explain us what consists of this, this, uh, uh, this part of of this expression? Compare it with well known for us electrical charge and maybe uh, maybe. Uh, maybe direct monopole charge. Explain, please, what is consists of yes. this, this part. Yes, yes. This uh, this will be actually written in the in the next uh, slide. Uh, I will. But but here I just say briefly that if you uh, you start from a vector potential, so the vector potential has four components. Vector potential is a space time vector. So A, A is a space-time vector. You start from that and you take, you apply this uh, space-time derivative to the vector field. And when you apply the space-time derivative, according to the Clifford algebra rules, you have the first part where you have a dot product and the second part, which you have a wedge product. And in the first part where you have a dot product, because you take a dot product between two vectors, you get a scalar because a dot product takes two vectors and gives you a scalar. So this is a scalar field. So it's a, in every point of space time, at every point in the space time, you have a number, a scalar number to this field. And this will be the electric charge. So actually this uh, S will tell you how much uh, electrically charged each point of space time is. That's what it means. If you have a plus, it's, it's a positive charge. If you have a minus, it's negative charge. Or I should say charge density, because of course we are talking about points in space time. So what you have with S is actually, is a number assigned to each point in space time. And in reality, this is a charge density that the space time has. And S, it means that S is only electric charge, no yeah, magnetic. Exactly, exactly. And if you want, uh, you can also have the magnetic charge. And uh, I will talk about it a little later. But here, to answer your question, uh, you have to have S with a pseudo scalar I. That's magnetic charge in Maxwell's equations. So you remember, we had this uh, I in front of the B. So I is the uh, pseudo scalar, uh, and you can uh, you can also have uh, the formulation where you have the I in front of the S, and so the I S is the equivalent for magnetic charges. And uh, I now I concentrate first on the electron. So here I wrote only S, but uh, in uh, in reality. You are right that there are two components here. There is S and there is also IS. And S is the electric density and IS is the magnetic uh, charge density. So that's, that's, that's uh, a good question. Uh, interrupt, please. Uh, I interrupt you. I want to explain it in Russian. Maybe not all of you understood. Likely, those who know English well understood, but maybe not all of you understood. He now says that only in this presentation, in this presentation, в этой презентации у нас говорит только об электрическом заряде. Вот это, вот это поле, поле скалярное, поле S. S это скалар, по сути дела. От, да. Отсюда S взялось. Он понимает по-русски, кстати, довольно хорошо. Вот. S. Это есть электрический заряд. Но он объяснил, что у него там в сплифордовской алгебре значит, есть такая вот хитрая единица, 
четырехмерная, по сути дела, ковариантная такая единица, которую, если приписать вот к скалярному полю, то там внутри будет содержаться и монополий. Но сегодня он рассказывает только о, об электрических зарядах. Sorry for interruption. Continue, please. Excuse me. Okay. And F, F is the electromagnetic fields. So F is the way we understand the electromagnetic field with the electric field and IB is the magnetic field. Okay. So let's uh, continue. <clears throat> then, uh, then your question was, you know, what do we know about S? I only told you that this is uh, the charge density. And uh, if we take the space-time gradient of charge density, then we get the uh, current density as a space-time vector. So, so what we are doing here, we take S, the scalar field as the starting point, and we apply the space-time derivative to S. Now, because um, S is a scalar, when you apply the space-time derivative on a scalar, then it's very simple expression. You can see here, you get a space-time vector, four-component vector. So this four-component vector is the J, which is the space-time uh, current density, right? So it tells you that uh, how much uh, charge is uh, flowing or how much charge is changing along X, Y, Z, or how much it is changing in time. Now, you can also then apply the dot product to uh, the space-time sigma dot product to this J vector and uh, here, what we are doing is that we are taking the space-time gradient of the current flow. So we take the space-time gradient of the current flow, then you see how much current is, has a gradient in X, Y, Z direction, or how much uh, charges are changing with time. And this space-time gradient has to be zero because of charge conservation, right? So, so simply, uh, if you have a region in space-time, then the currents flowing in is the same as the currents flowing out, or otherwise current is, uh, charge is accumulating. So, so because of charge conservation, this uh, gradient of the current is zero. And then we can combine these two equations. And by combining these two equations, you can see that we get a wave equation for S. See that uh, what uh, the combination of two equations gives is that you have the gradient square of S minus the uh, second derivative of S with respect to time is zero. And this is a, this is, looks like a very ordinary wave equation, but for the scalar field. So we know, of course, from electromagnetism, what is the solution of this wave equation? The solution is that uh, S moves at the speed of light. So what this really tells us that this uh, scalar field S, it cannot uh, stay in the same place, but the scalar field, just like any of the electric and magnetic fields must also be moving at the speed of light. So the very same way how fields in the, in the radio wave move up at the speed of light, also the scalar field must be moving at the speed of light. Now, at the first sight, this is very strange because, of course, we are used to seeing that electron is staying in the same place. Like, you know, electrons in my body, they don't move at the speed of light, it seems. But uh, how can it be that, that uh, we think electrons are moving at the speed of light? Well, the solution is the zeta bewegung that we have here. So, in fact, the speed of light movement is not in straight line, but it's in a helix. So what we call zeta bewegung is the helicoidal speed of light movement of electric charges. And uh, this is um, uh, the big uh, uh, conclusion that we come to, that every charged object must be moving at the speed of light along a helix path. And uh, what we perceive as the actual movement of the electron is just along the z direction, along the axis of this uh, helix. 
so this is Zita Bewegung, and this has a very, very long history. So I would say that the history of the Zita Bewegung concept begins with De Broly. So De Broly already in 1920s said that to every elementary particle, there is an associated angular frequency where omega de Broly is mc squared over h bar. Uh, this was de Broly's uh, observation and statement, which he just made as a postulate. He could not prove it yet at that time. Uh, then uh, uh, Schrodinger in 1930s said something very similar. And actually Schrodinger uh, came up with the Zitter Bewegung as a name. And uh, he said that every uh, particle has a sinusoidal oscillation, which he called zeta bewegung. And uh, he assigned the frequency of zeta bewegung to two times what the de Broly frequency was. And he also concluded that the amplitude of the zeta bewegung is similar to the reduced uh, Compton wavelengths. Mm -hmm. Very important observations. Now, uh, another German physicist called Hönel in 1938 uh, decided that actually it's better if the zeta bewegung is helicoidal, like I showed you in the previous slide, and not as a sinus wave. So, so he came up with helicoidal zeta bewegung. Then uh, the next step I highlighted here, uh, uh, paper by Kerson Huang was written or published in 1952. So this is a more detailed study of helicoidal zeta bewegung, and he successfully derived electron spin from this helicoidal motion. Now, an interesting historical observation, I believe that this study was written by Kerson Huang's teacher, not by him. So in the 1920s and 1930s, uh, these uh, discussions about zeta bewegung, they were mainstream physics. So this was mainstream physics at that time. However, uh, by 1940, 1950, mainstream physics went into a different direction. And in quantum field theory, they did not like to talk about zeta bewegung anymore. So in 1952, already quantum field theory was in the fashion. And uh, I think that uh, uh, because it was not a very popular subject, Kerson Huang's teacher, he gave uh, his uh, study to Kerson Huang and said, please publish it under your name. The reason why I think this was the case <clears throat> is because uh, Kerson Huang was 23 years old at that time in 52, and he never published anything similar before after that. After this paper, he went on a very mainstream direction and never talked about Zeta Bewegung anymore. And furthermore, uh, this was published in a journal that was uh, read by uh, science teachers. So, so normally a 23 year old person doesn't publish in a teacher's journal. So it's a very interesting that, uh, you know, what happens when some, something uh, goes out of the mainstream, then people find these interesting ways to publish their ideas. Okay, uh, so anyhow, back to the history. <clears throat> Next uh, important step in my view is that uh, a mathematician called Marcel Ries, uh, he was the first one to apply Clifford algebra to study electromagnetism. And he made uh, very interesting publications where he showed how uh, electromagnetism can be much more logically and simply described with uh, Clifford algebra. Uh, now the uh, most famous physicist uh, or actually mathematician, David Hesteness uh, was the one who continued the work of Marcellus. And he used Clifford algebra to describe not only electromagnetism, but also helicoidal uh, zeta bewegung. So, uh, so I would say that Heston has continued the work of Marcellus and uh, um, uh, our co-author, Giorgio Vassalo, in my opinion, has continued the work of David Heston 
and he actually completed this work and he properly derived um, helicoidal Zitterbewegung from uh, Maxwell's equation. And he clarified that the Zitterbewegung frequency is the Tabroli frequency. Because uh, ever since the time of Schrodinger, there was always this question mark in the physicist's head. Is the Tabravegung frequency Debroli frequency or Schrodinger frequency? And I think now we have the correct answer that the real frequency is the Debroli frequency. And I will show in the next slide what is the electron model that it leads to. Uh, okay, uh, there is one more slide. Before, before talking about the electron, I want to talk about uh, some subject that we are very familiar with. This is the normal transversal light. So this is, uh, I'm sorry if this is very trivial. Uh, this is something that we already learned in high school, how transversal waves propagate and induce each other. There are some, some points I want to uh, highlight nevertheless. So first point, as we know and remember from high school in a normal light wave, electric and magnetic fields induce each other the way it's shown in the picture. Now this uh, mutual induction is described by Maxwell's equation and very important, the electric and magnetic energy content is equal in a light wave. So, <clears throat> so you cannot ask, is there more electric field or more magnetic field? They are both present the same way, uh, equal energy. Uh, also, what is uh, important in the light field that there is no charge. So S is uh, zero in a light wave. So in that sense, uh, the uh, physicists 100 years ago were right when they were only describing light wave because the Lorentz gauge can be applied as long as you talk only about light wave without any charges. Uh, as I showed in the previous slide, if you consider a circularly polarized light wave, you can describe the electromagnetic field by this E plus IB expression, which is almost like a complex number. So we can think of taking its uh, complex conjugate. So what does complex conjugate mean? In this sense, it means that electric field stays the same, magnetic field changes uh, its sign. So F star is E minus IB. So if we multiply uh, these uh, two together, then the number which we get is B square minus E square. So, so F F star is B square minus E square. Uh, now, <clears throat> what is interesting is that from general relativity, you have the Lorentz transformation rules of electromagnetic fields. And if you try to Lorentz transform B square minus E square, you will find that this uh, is Lorentz invariant. So F F star is Lorentz invariant. And that is not a coincidence. In the book, we derive that actually this uh, B square minus E square is uh, the electromagnetic Lagrangian. So you would, of course, expect the Lagrangian to be a Lorentz invariant. And uh, this is, uh, looks like almost a connection to quantum mechanics, because in quantum mechanics, if we take psi as a part of probability density, or as psi as a wave function, then how does quantum mechanics describe probability density? Probability density is a psi psi star. So it's uh, very similar how we can describe it in electromagnetism, almost the same way how it's described in quantum mechanics. And this is not a coincidence because I believe in both cases, this expression gives you the Lagrangian and uh, the particle, of course, uh, particle trajectory is uh, defined by its Lagrangian density. Okay, so, so after this uh, refresher from high school, now let's look at the uh, electron model. And uh, this is our electron model that we get by uh, 
applying Maxwell's equation. So in the electron, very same way how in a light wave, electrical and magnetic fields induce each other. Only difference with respect to light is that topology is different. In the electron, you have a charged sphere and this electric charge moves around in a circle. And this circular movement of the charge is what is going to induce magnetic fields uh, from the middle. And vice versa, the magnetic field that you have here is going to induce back the electric field. Now, because we apply Maxwell's equation uh, on every scale, we can ask us, uh, what is the electric energy density? Now, this is uh, quite simple to calculate because we just uh, sum up the square of the electric field. And we have a spherical charge. So we uh, sum up all the electric field down to this uh, radius of the electric charge. So the total electric energy is going to be given by this integral. And when the integral expression has one over R squared, when you integrate out the electric field energy and you do this one over R squared uh, from the charge radius to infinity. So what you get in, in the end is the expression with one over R. You integrate one over R squared, you get one over R from R zero to infinity. So what you have is inverse proportionality between uh, electrons charge radius and electric energy. So if you use uh, the classical electron charge reduce this 2.82 femtometers for R0. Not surprising, what you get for electric field energy is 25.5 uh, kilo electron volt. So this tells you that uh, if you use the classical electron charge reduce 2.82 femtometers, then the corresponding electric energy is exactly half of the electron energy. And this gives you the physical meaning of the charge it is. So the, this 2.82 FM is, is really the physical size of the electron charge. And you have the scalar field non-zero on the surface of this uh, sphere. Similarly, we can calculate the total magnetic energy. So the magnetic energy is given by this uh, well-known expression. It's one half of phi and I. Phi is the magnetic flux and I is the electric current. Now the electric current is very simple to calculate because you have electric charge moving at the speed of light on this circle. So then the corresponding current is E times C divided by the circumference of the circle two pi R. And uh, the magnetic flux is a bit more complicated, but uh, in the book we calculate that the flux is two pi h bar over e. It's it's also quite straightforward calculation. So what you get <clears throat> for the magnetic energy is this expression, h bar c over two r e, where r e is this uh, zeta bewegung radius. So so here we take for the zeta bewegung radius this third 386 femtometers. Does anybody recognize what this number is? Well, this is a number is actually well known in physics. This is the reduced Compton radius. So if you use reduced Compton radius as the zeta gravitational radius, then again, you find that half of the electron energy is magnetic energy. Right, 255 kilo electron volts. So we have uh, the very nice expression, very much analogous to the uh, usual light wave, that half of the electric energy is electric field, half of the electron energy is magnetic field. You have the charge radius given by the classical electron radius, and we have the zeta bewegung radius given by the reduced Compton radius. And uh, notice that you have in both cases, the one over R expression. So in both cases, the energy is proportional 
by the inverse of the radius. So we can conclude from this model that electron mass is nothing else but electromagnetic field energy. And this is a very, very important conclusion because uh, it's philosophically important that we finally understand what electron is made of. Electron is made of nothing else, just electromagnetic field. And the energy of the field is the electron mass. So this uh, defines the meaning of Einstein's formula, E equals mc squared. This is exactly what E equals mc squared means. Okay, any, so any question about the electron model? Вопросы есть у кого-нибудь к этой модели? Вот, Андрес, I have a question. Uh, for calculation electric density, you uh, uh, use a, uh, you use a, a space space from the uh, infinity till the radius r sub zero. Yes, exactly. But what what is what can you say about electrical energy inside of this radius? It's, it's zero. So there is no electric field inside. So it's just, you can think of it as a ball. The charge is on the surface of the ball. Inside of the ball, there is, there is zero electric field. It means that you model very coincide with model of Abraham, which uh, consider that electron consists of uh, some sphere, uh, Filled with the uh, with the electricity and no and no charge inside of this sphere. Okay, thank you. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Charge is on the surface of the sphere. Yes. Okay, друзья, еще у кого-нибудь есть какие-нибудь вопросы вот по этой части? Что такое заряд? What is the charge? Yeah, the charge is the scalar field. So the. Now what is the scalar field indeed? What is the scalar field? It is mathematical. It is mathematical trick. No, 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 it's not. No, you will see in the following slides, you will see it's very physical. So, what is it? so let me go back. So the, the scalar the, field is derived from vector potential. And what is vector potential? So the, uh, well, what, well, the vector what is vector potential, potential in reality? Where it is, okay. where it comes from? Yeah, well, that's that's the question that oh, I think everybody would like to know. Andrew, Andrew. Ah, so you don't know, you are basing on what you don't know, and then you're making big steps. Well, well you have to no, you have to start from somewhere. I mean, what is no, space? But no, what no, 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 not. You can um, start with that problem. What is vector potential? And yeah, 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 we have to start from somewhere. No, you can ask what is time. And it's it is very methodologically, it is methodologically wrong. You have to first, uh, uh, first describe what is the vector potential, where it comes from, and then start. No, 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 no. This is this is exactly the point. This is what I was explaining before that this was the methodology that they used uh, classically. So hundred since hundred years. This was the methodology that was used. They and said, it was wrong. The methodology was wrong, and and you are now right. Yeah, yeah, Why so, the well, methodology of uh, hundred years old was uh, wrong? Why? Yeah. So, so Valoda, Valoda, stop, please. Uh, well, it's, here, it's, here I had a slide it, about it, this. It, it's discussion. It's not a question. Uh, okay. Uh, thank okay, you. Okay. Let's let's let's, uh, let's go back to this in the question session. But here I had one slide about why the, the classical methodology I think is problematic. Others, continue, please. Uh, and well, I want another. You show that, that the main uh, equation, this one, electric energy density, this electric energy density is estimate. It is not the correct, it comes not from any, uh, uh, any Maxwell equations. No, it does, it does. Because, no, because this no, is no, 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 it's you, in the book. no, 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 it, it, it is book in the book, but it is not right. Uh, no, you, you, can write derive, that, you can derive it from Maxwell's equations that this is the electric energy density. You can derive this from Maxwell's equations. It is not uh, tested. It is not directly tested. And what you are going about, you, you, you take the Maxwellian equations, multiply by E, another you take multiplying by B, and then you... Uh, summarizing them, and then that you take this one. 
from this Robert. equation does not go this for equation. Uh, no. don't, don't, uh, let us uh, continue. Okay. Okay, let us continue. Uh, so I just I just say that what is uh, tested is that electron has. Andrew, 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 please. Uh, we we have we we shall have a discussion. Okay. Uh, so okay. Okay. Let's let's continue from here. Uh, so then. Uh, uh, we had so we had some questions. Of course, uh, it's very important to ask critical questions. And if you tell this model to your friends, uh, I think very often your friends will will not believe you right away. Maybe some will believe you, some will not believe you, and uh, it's normal to be skeptical about a new model. So usually, uh, I of course told already to many people or some people about this model, and we get some, uh, some questions. So I here uh, now will highlight two skeptical questions that I think are interesting questions to consider because uh, good uh, skeptical questions uh, help you to develop the model. So the first um, a skeptic statement is uh, what about high energy accelerator collisions? So in accelerator, they accelerate electrons to high uh, energy, and then they collide, and then they analyze collision products. And from accelerator, it looks like the electron is very, very tiny, uh, much less than the uh, classical uh, charge reduce. So they would say that, uh -huh, accelerator proves that the electron is much smaller. OK, but <clears throat> we have to remember that uh, when uh, the charge moves at a high speed, the Zitterbewegung uh, radius is actually shrinking down. And this you can see very simple from a geometric model. So the uh, charges move at the speed of light, see? And you have uh, two components uh, to this movement, two orthogonal components. So you have the movement along Z direction where the electron moves and the perpendicular Zitterbewegung. And uh, with a Pythagorean theorem, you square the two, you get C squared. Now, if you uh, have Zitterbewegung movement, of course, the speed is omega times R. So this uh, Zitterbewegung speed is omega squared R squared. And uh, this is a high speed electron in the left. And then in the rest frame, you have no Z, speed, you have only omega squared, r squared. That is only you have zeta vacuum speed in the rest frame. In both cases, uh, the uh, speed of the charge is exactly the speed of light. <clears throat> so from this uh, very simple geometric consideration, you can consider that what is the ratio of the zeta vacuum radius uh, if you have a speed of z. And uh, uh, by uh, solving this equation, you can see that the uh, zeta bewegung radius uh, shrinks down with a relativistic formula uh, as the electron moves faster. So here is a geographic illustration. Uh, you have in the rest frame, you have the maximum zeta bewegung radius. And the faster the electron moves, the more, the more it is uh, shrinking down. Now, from the previous slide, you will remember that electric energy is the inverse of the radius, right? So inverse of zeta bewegung radius and inverse of uh, charge radius. So it means that the mass is the inverse of this ratio. And here you get very simply the relativistic mass formula. Relativistic mass is rest free mass divided by this uh, Lorentz factor. So this is uh, Einstein's uh, relativistic mass formula divided, derived in a simple way. And so we understand that actually when we accelerate the electron in accelerator, of course it looks very tiny because it's uh, relativistically shrinking. And then here comes a skeptic comment number two who says that, aha, but if you accelerate something then Lorentz contraction is only shrinking along the z-axis. So you accelerate in z-direction, Lorentz contraction is only in z-direction. So then uh, our electron would not be spherical anymore, but it would look like uh, ellipsoid or pancake. 
So this uh, is a naive uh, view, but <clears throat> not correct view, <clears throat> because we must um, remember that there is also Doppler effect. And Doppler effect applies to all uh, electromagnetic waves. So here I show a simple scenario. Uh, electron moves along the z-axis in a certain speed. And we know from uh, Heisenberg uncertainty that if you have a, a fixed speed, your position uncertainty is infinite. So if you have a fixed speed of the electron, then it's uh, along the z-axis is like an infinitely uh, spread. So for, for simplicity, then this uh, moving electron, uh, I model as this uh, wave that's going around as a Zeta wave. And the wave looks like uh, this uh, because it's the same everywhere, it's spread by Heisenberg uncertainty. So now if you change the, uh, your frame by Lorentz transformation, then uh, uh, relativistic Lorentz transformation uh, causes a Doppler effect and you have to apply the uh, Doppler effect uh, to your wave, to your electromagnetic wave. So, so what we have is two effects. <clears throat> First, you have along z-axis Lorentz contraction that shrinks by gamma L and along uh, this x and y-axis of the wave, you have the transversal Doppler effect and transversal Doppler effect is also shrinking by gamma L, exactly the same way. So what you have is that all three axes, X, Y, and Z, all three axes, your electromagnetic wave is shrinking by gamma L, by the same uh, Lorentz factor. So it means that electron always remains a spherical charge, no matter how you Lorentz transform it. This is uh, very important to understand that uh, relativity is uh, very much uh, in line with our model. Okay, so now we jump into deep physics and uh, we will use what we learned so far to calculate the anomalous magnetic moment. Now, if you talk to quantum field theorists, they will say that, oh, no, 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 be careful because it's a 50 page calculation to calculate anomalous magnetic moment. Now, what I will show you here is that mm, you don't need 50 pages, you can calculate it in two slides. So the magnetic moment is traditionally derived by this uh, mu equals E h bar over two times mass of the electron formula. Now notice that in this magnetic moment formula, the only thing that's not constant is the electron mass, right? E and h bar are physical constants. So since uh, we know now that electron mass is derived from electromagnetic induction, uh, any kind of anomalous excess moment means uh, 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 too little deficit of mass, so that it means incomplete induction, right? Now let me repeat that again. If you have mu anomalously large, it means that mass is anomalously small, which means that your electromagnetic induction is uh, incomplete. Now, let's... Andres, Andres may, may I repeat it in, in Russian? Yes. Andres, Andres сейчас говорит о том, что uh, вот эта формула для магнитного момента электрона, она как бы упрощенная, полная, как он ее назвал. Вот. Но uh, это нужно... Но известно, что там есть так называемый G-фактор, вот он там вот внизу, он его сейчас введет. Этот же фактор значит, он для электрона один, там, для каждой частицы он свой, этот же фактор вот, И он сейчас будет об этом же факторе говорить, который связан вот с особенностью, вот это гермагнитное соотношение, по-русски, если так сказать. Thank you, thank you, Andres, continue. Okay. okay, so let's consider how the uh, induction works. So the idea is, that the electron makes one circle in this zeta uh, circle. And the idea is that you have a complete uh, induction in one circle. I mean, that's what the model is assuming, that it assumes that you have a complete induction of the 
magnetic field in one circle, and then the process repeats itself. Every circle, you have a complete induction of the field. But um, uh, if you think of the relativistic uh, propagation of signals, in, the, in one circle, if the electron moves with a speed c, uh, then uh, this uh, speed limit c means that the uh, space volume from which electromagnetic signals propagate is uh, two pi times your radius of the circle, right? So electron moves at the speed of light. Also electric fields propagate at the speed of light. So by the time electron completes this two pi r movement, the electric signals can propagate uh, from space from this uh, sphere with a radius two pi r. So it means that you don't have uh, the complete uh, electric energy that's participating in this induction, right? We have in the previous slide, we have uh, derived the formula for total electric energy. So the total electric energy is the integral from R0 to infinity. This is the total electric energy. However, the only electric energy that participates in one turn is the integral from R0 to 2 pi uh, Re, and Re is the zeta bewegung radius. So it means that uh, during one turn, uh, the uh, electric energy that participates in the induction is less than the total energy. And this is exactly the energy that participates. So we can take the ratio. So what is the ratio of total energy uh, and the uh, ratio of the actually participating energy? If you take uh, the ratio of these two expressions, you, you get this formula, one minus charge radius over uh, two pi uh, zeta bewegung radius. And the inverse of this ratio is the uh, G factor, the gyromagnetic factor. So what this tells you is that the magnetic induction does not complete in one circle, but it's an iterative process. And in one circle, you have uh, less than the total electric energy participating. The limit is set by the relativistic uh, signal propagation limit. And so the gyromagnetic uh, factor is nothing else than the ratio of the energy that participates in one circle with respect to the total electric energy. So now we understand that there is a mass deficit and the mass deficit creates this uh, anomalously large magnetic moment. Okay, this is the theory and very simple. And now we apply this uh, theory to calculate the electrons and the protons uh, anomalous magnetic moment. So for the electron, we put in the charge radius and the zeta bewegung radius. And the ratio of these two numbers for the electron is actually the fine structure constant. So this is uh, alpha over two pi. And because alpha over two pi is a small number, uh, that's why this is approximately becomes one plus uh, alpha over two pi. So this is a uh, Schwinger's formula. And this is where Schwinger's formula comes from, but you can see it's only an approximation. And also what is very, very important to remember is that the real control factor is not alpha because Schwinger saw that alpha is the control factor, but no, the real control factor is these two radius values. Just for the electron, the ratio happens to be alpha. <clears throat> so this is the experimental G factor for the electron. And this is our uh, calculation. So our calculation is six digits accurate. It's, it's quite good. Now let's see if we can use the same formula for the proton. Now <clears throat> for the proton, for a long time, the problem was that its radius value was uncertain. And this uncertainty in the real uh, proton radius value was referred to as the so-called proton radius puzzle. So you can read many articles about proton radius puzzle. Uh, fortunately for last year, there was a 
breakthrough in this uh, measurement accuracy. And here I uh, highlight this uh, article at the bottom, uh, which was uh, published in Science in last year. And this is a new method and a very accurate method for measuring the protons uh, charge reduce. So according to this new method, the protons charge reduce is 0 0.8482 uh, femtometers. Now, <clears throat> the zeta bewegung radius, we know precisely just from the proton mass. And uh, we substitute these two numbers in our formula. Again, exactly the same formula. And we get 99.99% uh, accuracy of our calculation with respect to the experimental value. So I think that's uh, quite uh, good. And also I want to emphasize that uh, when, when we published this formula in the first edition of the book, that was already almost two years ago. So we published the formula before the actual measurement value of the proton charge reduced. So in that sense, it's, it's really a prediction. So we did not fit any numbers. We did a proper prediction because we had the formula before, before this measurement was made. Uh, okay, so, so is, there, is there any question about the uh, G-factor calculation? Вопросы есть по, по гермагнитному соотношению? Нет вопросов. Continue, please. Okay. So, so two, two comments that I think uh, this uh, shows that uh, there is a very, some, some similarity between the electron and the uh, proton. So there is, we see the same physical principle. Whether we talk about electron or proton, we see the same physical principles that are uh, playing out. The other thing that's important, if you think about a muon, the muon has almost the same G factor as the electron. There is only a small difference. So it means that for the muon, if the G factor is the same, then the ratio of the charge reduced and the zeta perfect radius must be the same as in the electron. So in a way, the muon can be sort of as a scaled down electron, but, but very similar uh, structure. Uh, okay, let's go. Uh, uh, go. Uh, so now, now the next point is about the charge uh, quantization. So if you look again at our Maxwell's equation, how we derived uh, uh, magnetic uh, charges, sorry, electric charges at electromagnetic field from vector potential, we took <clears throat> We took the space-time gradient of vector potential, and uh, then you have the charges and fields. <clears throat> now, this is a linear equation. So, so the question comes in, how do you explain uh, charge quantization from a linear equation? Because if you have a linear equation, you have two times or three times or four times the value, it works the same way. It looks like you cannot get uh, charge quantization from a linear equation. And this is correct because uh, we have to remember that uh, it's a linear equation only when you have a flat space time. And this is where it's important to remember uh, that what I said in the beginning, we apply Maxwell's equation and relativity at all uh, the uh, scales. So what we have to remember is that if you have electric energy density, it creates space-time curvature. So when you get close to the electron, uh, space-time is curved because that's what relativity tells you. The more electric energy you have, the more space-time curvature you have. And when you take space-time curvature into account, the effective wave equation is no longer linear. And uh, I think that uh, this is also the topic that Dr. Zatalepin talked about in his presentation. And a uh, very important realization that <coughs> the effective equation is maybe no longer linear if you take space-time curvature into account. And uh, we think that this is the basis of the charge quantization. 
Now, uh, my co-author, Giorgio Vassallo, derives a geometric condition in the book for uh, charge quantization. And what we find is that there are uh, three uh, quantities that are mutually defining each other. You can have E as the electron charge, elementary charge. Uh, it's related to the fine structure constant, alpha. So in natural units, uh, five structure constant is nothing else than e to the minus second uh, power. And it's also related to the magnetic flux uh, of the electron. So if we calculate from our model, the magnetic flux in natural units, the magnetic flux is only two pi over e. So we have three quantities that are mutually related. And if you know one of the three, you know all three. So hopefully in the near future, we should be able to calculate at least one of these three, and then we know the other. And this is a very interesting mathematical challenge to see if we can somehow calculate from relativity and Maxwell equation, why these numbers take this value. So this is a hundred year old puzzle, why alpha minus one is 137. And I hope we will be able to solve this puzzle in the future but uh, not yet today. Okay, <clears throat> now the next topic is electromagnetic uh, symmetries. So uh, as I, this is a bit mathematical again, uh, as I mentioned in the previous slide, uh, Lorentz boost preserves E square minus B square. Now the Lorentz boost as a transformation has a SU2 uh, symmetry group. Uh, other transformation you can do is spatial rotation. You can uh, rotate your uh, perspective. And not surprisingly, spatial rotation preserves S square plus E square plus B square. This is uh, electromagnetic energy density. This is not surprising. If I rotate my perspective, of course, the energy density doesn't change. I can look at any direction. Now, spatial rotations also have SU2 symmetry group, and uh, this is a double coverage of the uh, SO3, usual SO3 space time rotation group. Now, it turns out that there is another transformation which preserves electromagnetic energy density, and that other transformation is if I uh, rotate the uh, time vector in a smart way, I rotate it with the help of this <clears throat> Clifford pseudoscalar. So the Clifford pseudoscalar, uh, remember this I construction, we can exponentiate it. Uh, it's a mathematically well-defined operation. And after <coughs> exponentiating it with some theta factor, this is like a rotation factor. So in effect, I can uh, uh, rotate the time direction between uh, so-called real values and imaginary values. And the, the imaginary values means the pseudoscalar values. Maybe a better way of saying it, <clears throat> we can rotate the uh, time uh, vector uh, in a way that's multiplying it between a scalar and pseudoscalar multiplication. And this type of rotation also has a U1 symmetry group. So as I mentioned, I is the Clifford pseudoscalar, gamma t is the unit vector in the time axis, and S square plus E square plus B square is the electric energy density. <clears throat> now, actually, there is uh, somebody who published a similar idea, uh, Mr. Gerrit Kodens. He published this article I here highlight, where he published similar idea, but uh, uh, Mr. Codens was not uh, using Clifford algebra, and he thought of this as a mathematical curiosity. However, <clears throat> I think this is not just mathematical curiosity. This has a very real physical significance. So now when we consider the complete symmetry group of the energy density preserving transformations, we have the U1 cross SU2 uh, mathematical group. Now we know from Noether's theorem that 
every symmetry corresponds to a conserved physical quantity. <clears throat> well, we know what is the conserved quantity with the rotation symmetry, that is angular momentum conservation. In terms of the electron, this is spin conservation. So SU2 corresponds to spin conservation, and U1 part also corresponds to some conservation. And I propose this corresponds to the isospin conservation. Now, in this sense, uh, because we work with electromagnetic quantities, the correct way to say is that this is electromagnetic isospin. Is it the same isospin that physicists start talking about? The history of isospin is also quite old. It was introduced by Heisenberg and Wigner in the 1930s when they were studying the neutron decay process. So they understood that there is something with the neutron that is new to the previous reactions. And uh, they were not quite sure exactly what's happening physically, but they saw that there is some kind of a, a spin-like quantity that's conserved, but is different than physical spin. So they introduced the term isospin, and in their language, isospin means something which is analogous to the spin, but not physical rotation. <clears throat> now, today, physicists use isospin in a quite complicated way. The question remains, is my isospin the same as the isospin that was introduced by Heisenberg and Wigner? And uh, I believe the question is yes, but this remains to be validated. So my proposition is that understanding this uh, approach leads to the understanding of neutrinos and isospin. And this we will discuss in the next slides. <clears throat> but before we go to the neutrinos, are there any questions about this, these last few slides? Вопросы какие-то есть перед тем, как следующим слайдом перейти. Ну, вопросы мы задаем с помощью поднятия ладошки тут вот. Поскольку никаких ладошек нет, то можно переходить к следующим. Okay. So, so this then is our last topic that we will start to talk about uh, neutrinos. Once a moment. Uh, one and a half, uh, one and a half hour we uh, we have a webinar. Maybe within ten minutes, please. Uh, okay. Okay, I will try. Yes, I think I think there is only a few slides left. Uh -huh, okay. uh, so so and this first slide is actually a very trivial slide, and I'm sorry for the trivial slide, but but this will be important. So when we detect electromagnetic waves, we have to use the correct equipment for the correct type of waves, right? When we detect gamma rays, we use a scintillator equipment. When we detect radio frequency waves, we use a parabolic antenna to concentrate them. Now we cannot use gamma. Uh, uh, you cannot get detect gamma rays with a parabola, and you cannot detect radio frequency waves with a scintillator. I'm sorry for saying the trivial things, but uh, this is important because uh, we have to keep this in mind. And we, of course, uh, today already know that gamma rays are physically the same as radio frequency rays. Only difference is a different wavelengths. Other than different wavelengths, there is no other difference. Yet, physically, they appear very different. And the same is true for neutrinos. <clears throat> so if we talk about high frequency neutrinos, there is this fancy scintillator room that we have here in the photos. That's the appropriate equipment. And if we talk about low frequency neutrinos, we have um, uh, Parkhamov's pioneering experiment where he showed that we can use a parabola to collect low frequency neutrinos and they induce uh, beta decay rate a uh, thousand times faster than normal rates. So they have a very real physical nuclear effect. And here is the uh, reference for uh, 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 Alexander Parkhamov's work already 15 years ago, this was uh, published. So, so the reason why this is important to remember is because when I discuss this topic with some people, some people say that, oh, neutrinos cannot be electromagnetic because they use this big scintillator equipment to detect them. But this is of course not true. We just have to remember that 
the difference between high frequency neutrinos and low frequency neutrinos is the same like difference between uh, uh, gamma rays and radio frequency uh, waves. So there is a question. Okay, please, please ask question. Анатолий Климов вот хочет задать вопрос. Толь, давай. Андрес, please tell me us what the difference between the ordinary electron and protons according to your approach. Okay, well that's 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 a very difficult question because. Uh, let's go back so that I only talked about the proton here. So, so here I told you that uh, the proton also has some kind of electromagnetic uh, induction, but uh, there is a big difference between them because uh, uh, from accelerator experiments, uh, it is seen that uh, electron is uh, only one uh, elementary particle, like electron doesn't fall into two. However, with accelerator experiments, it can be seen that the proton has uh, subparticles inside. So in that sense, the proton is not a real uh, elementary particle because accelerator experiments show that the proton is still composed of uh, several other particles. But, uh, but regardless of that, the proton has a well-defined charge radius. So what I would say, and this is something that is a little bit speculative because uh, we, let's say, don't uh, have yet, in my view, a very clear data, but it looks like in the electron, you have a charge sphere and inside the charge sphere, it's empty. There is, a, there is a no electric field inside the charge sphere. For a proton, it looks like you have a charge sphere but inside the charge sphere, it's not empty for the proton. You still have subparticles inside the charge sphere of the proton. That's, that's oh, 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 okay. Okay. Oh, okay. Most simple uh, uh, question. What's the difference uh, uh, between the electron and positron uh, according, oh, your, uh, according your approach? Uh, yeah, according my approach, the only difference is that uh, S is negative for electron and positive for positron. So the, the sign of the S is the only difference. Uh, 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 what's uh, uh, the, the difference uh, uh, of the ch signal charge? Uh, uh, it's, uh, the nature is not clear uh, according to the uh, uh, charge. Uh, uh, no, 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 the S. Uh, the, the, the physics of charge is non uh, clear and non, uh, it's uh, only mysteries uh, uh, according to your approach. Uh, no. Uh -huh. Uh, no difference. S is a scalar, so S is a scalar, so S can have a positive or negative value. So the difference between the uh, electron and positron is just the sign, sign of the S. Uh, uh, you, pre you propose that there is uh, two type of the charges, uh, negative and positive. What's the difference between the positive and negative uh, charge according to your approach? Well, according to my approach, is just the sign of the S, that S is positive or negative. Uh, and, uh, uh, Andres, I, 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 could, I, could, I could advise you to, to look at the uh, expression from uh, Clifford algebra that uh, S is a, is, a, uh, uh, is a multiplication, is the multiplication of two, two values, two, two vectors. And it means that in that multiplications, scal scalar multiplications, two vectors uh, is not coincide, but is uh, directed in opposite direction. This is, this is the reason why uh, multiplication could be plus, uh, could have plus and minus sign. It my, it my advice to you. Yeah, yeah, this is, uh, this is another, uh, uh, this is uh, true that uh, uh, if you look only at the signs, you can, you can have uh, two uh, uh, models which are equivalent. You can say that uh, uh, positrons, uh, they have uh, moved forward in time, but uh, their uh, vector potential is opposite than electrons. 
so that the vector potential signs are different. Or you could also say that electrons and positrons have the same uh, vector potential, but one is moving forward in time, other is moving backward in time. So this, this is of course true that you have this ambiguity, but I don't believe in moving backward in time because I think that uh, uh, of course you have the arrow of time defined by entropy. So even if mathematically you could have uh, two approaches, I think uh, because of entropy increase, things uh, have to move forward in time. Anders, according to your, your uh, approach, uh, it's uh, uh, not clear what the uh, mass of the posit positrons, proton, uh, electron. What's, and what is the entropy? What, and what, what is entropy in your approach? Володь, ну дай я задам, потом ты задашь. Да, потому что это к одному. Ну, ну вот еще раз. Если Эндрус понимает по-русски, еще раз по-русски, значит, вот согласно твоей алгебре, значит, вот есть константы, которые у тебя непонятно откуда берутся. Масса и скорость света. Ты определил так. Но это значит, если ты определил, это значит, ну вот согласно обычной газодинамике, это ты уже определил волны, простые волны Риммана, ты уже задал их. Неужели ты это не понимаешь? Yeah, so the, so the speed of light is, is cannot be derived, it's a constant. So, of course, in Maxwell's equations, you can, uh, you can either take C as a constant, or you can have the epsilon, the electromagnetic you know, permeability to be as a constant. So you either start from saying that nature defines C as a constant, or you can say that the electric and magnetic permeability of space is defined by constant, but these, these things you cannot calculate. So, so you have to take some constant as a starting point because that's uh, in a way, that's the relation between space and time metric. So and what the is... way I think about it is that Володя, Володя и Анатолий, я считаю, что Андрош ответил на том уровне, которым он сейчас понимает. Вопрос был задан, ответ получен. Андрош, continue, please. Yeah, yeah, okay, let's continue. So we finish with the neutrinos. So, so I just about this last question, I summarize that we measure space distance and we measure time distance. And in my view, uh, C is a speed of light is a scaling factor that relates how you measure time distance with how you measure space distance. And this is somehow defined by nature, the relation between these axes. Okay, so let's go. Можно спросить, можно спросить, а вот диэлектрическая проницаемость откуда берется и чем она определена? И второе, что понимает Андрес по словами энтропия в такой ситуации? Есть ли там энтропия или это просто слова? Uh, so uh, okay. So regarding regarding the uh, space and time permeability, you either define C or you define epsilon and mu. So of course uh, you you choose. If you define C, you calculate epsilon and mu, or if you define epsilon and mu, you calculate C. Mm -hmm. But one of them you have to define. Uh, the <clears throat> the the entropy I I don't uh, understand well in this context. So so to me the entropy defines whether time goes forward or backward. But uh, of course, uh, uh, I understand entropy only in the sense how we learn it in, uh, in high school, that entropy is uh, statistically the uh, increase of disorder, but I don't have any more deep understanding of it. In high school, we are studying that entropy is integral of the Q divided by T. And the statistical entropy, which uh, was introduced by Planck, it's some, uh, it's some, uh, how to say, it's some uh, hypothesis based on based on, on works on the both. Yeah, yeah, but well, entropy is a different topic. So I don't, sorry, I don't have an understanding of entropy. It's a different, it's a different topic, and I don't have any good understanding of it. But okay, I suggest let's go. Let's go on with neutrinos, and, and and then yeah, after neutrinos, we will uh, we will uh, can come back to the questions. Okay, so now we have uh, some elementary particle reactions that uh, produce neutrinos. One example is uh, muon decay. So when muon decays into an electron, 
then according to the current physical model, it produces two neutrinos. I I'm not sure actually if it's one or two because I don't think it was really measured if it's two, but that's the physical model. Uh, other reaction, when a neutron decays to a proton plus electron, there is always a third, uh, third uh, product. Third product is called antineutrino. And it's still open question in physics whether antineutrino is same or different than neutrino. But the main point here is that there are certain physical reactions which when happen, there is always a neutrino being uh, emitted. And actually the energy of the neutrino, the energy density can be measured. And neutron is a very nice system because it's possible to measure the energy of the proton and electron products. And by measuring their energy, I think here is uh, electron energy, proton energy, and antineutrino energy is the missing energy. So you can have a nice uh, chart of what is the probability of neutrino energy when the neutron decays. You can see that it's uh, a big range. So, <clears throat> so you can see that it spans from uh, high energy to low energy. And of course the probability here gets small, but nevertheless not zero. So we also have some part of the emitted neutrinos being uh, rather low energy neutrinos. Now, <clears throat> the important uh, point here is that if we see these neutrino emissions always in elementary particle uh, reactions, then uh, the intuition tells us that these must be some trivial solutions of uh, Maxwell equation if they are electromagnetic waves. Because uh, normal light emission is a trivial solution of the transversal wave. And we would not expect an elementary particle reaction to create some kind of a very complex uh, topological solution, but uh, we would uh, expect that a propagating wave must be always some kind of a trivial solution of Maxwell equation. Okay, now another source of uh, neutrinos is from uranium fission. So these are experiments which uh, should uh, have never been done, but unfortunately, well, we know that some, some uranium fission experiments are being done. <clears throat> and uh, what observation tells us <clears throat> is that 6% uh, of uranium fission energy is carried away by neutrinos. That's quite a large percentage. So far, all the neutrino measurements tell us that neutrinos travel at the speed of light. So when a, a nuclear explosion happens, what is the speed of light traveling uh, component? It's called EMP, it's called electromagnetic pulse. So this electromagnetic pulse, it cannot be ordinary transversal wave because it has very different effects on materials than, than normal light waves or, or gamma waves. So can we identify a neutrino effect with electromagnetic pulse? Now, if we do that, then it tells us that neutrinos should be longitudinal wave. Why? Because what we know from observations is that this electromagnetic pulse, it causes current surges in the material, meaning that it accelerates electrons suddenly to a certain direction. So, <clears throat> so if this is neutrinos, then it means that the effect of low frequency neutrinos is that they accelerate electrons into a certain direction, which uh, indicates that they should be longitudinal wave. Okay, let's uh, summarize so far. If we want to model neutrinos as electromagnetic waves, we are looking for the following properties. We want some trivial solution of Maxwell's equation. And this is uh, something that's a big challenge because you would expect that in the last hundred years, all the trivial solutions were found. We want a wave that travels at the speed of light, a longitudinal wave, and we want it to carry this uh, isospin rotation. <clears throat> okay, so this is the challenge. And here, uh, my slide is showing what my proposed solution is. So in the book, I uh, describe uh, this kind of trivial solution to Maxwell equation, where uh, if the wave propagates in the Z direction, so the electric fields points in the Z direction with a sinus wave, 
Magnetic field also points in the z direction, but with a cosine wave. And the scalar field is uh, uh, fluctuating between the real valued and the I multiplied scalar with a cosine and sine uh, factors. So if you put this uh, trivial solution to the Maxwell equation, you will find that, yes, actually this is a solution of Maxwell equation. So, so this wave equation, wave solution is a solution of sigma g equals zero. And you can see right away why, why was this not found in the last hundred years. It was not found because the scalar field is not zero. And people were only looking for uh, S equals zero solutions. So this uh, is the reason why we can identify this new solution. It of course travels at the speed of light because the electromagnetic induction as we discussed previously happens at the speed of light. And this is a longitudinal wave. So here I have some uh, picture about the spatial geometry that the electric and magnetic fields, they always point in the direction of propagation and they fluctuate in their uh, direction. And this is an induction between electric and magnetic uh, field energy. And you can see that it carries isospin so that the E and B fields rotate into each other and also S rotates into IS. So this uh, fulfills all the requirements that we have for the neutrino solution. And I propose that neutrinos are particles only in the sense that photons are particles, but a more uh, useful way of thinking of neutrinos is that neutrino is an electric wave described by this uh, trivial solution. So, so here is an example. This is my last slide. Uh, how isospin conservation requires neutrino emission. Now, first, uh, I start with spin conservation example. Think of electron and positron annihilation. When electron and positron meets, we have uh, two circularly polarized photons which are emitted. And why photons? And the reason is spin conservation. So these uh, circular polarized photons, they carry away the spin of the incoming uh, particles. Now, similarly, we can now think of the isospin conservation example uh, and specifically think of a muon decay. In the <clears throat> previous slides, we have already discussed that the electron and muon are almost the same particle. They have same structure. You can think of muon as a scaled down electron. It means that uh, muon has the same spin as the electron. So if a muon decays to an electron, there is no change in the spin. So that means that it doesn't have to emit photons. Uh, however, we observe physically that muon decay always accompanied by neutrino emissions. So it means that the muon must have non-zero isospin. And uh, I believe that in, uh, whether a reaction um, emits neutrinos or not, it tells us whether the isospin of the emitting particle changes or not. This is my proposition. And this is my last slide. So thank you for the attention. And uh, I hope that uh, this uh, new view of Maxwell equation is, is inspiring for you. So now I see that there is many questions and we can go through them. Thank you, thank you Andres. Uh, друзья, ну вот я вижу тут четыре у нас uh, человека уже выразили желание. Наверное, их будет больше. Но прошу учитывать, что Вот тем, кто задает вопросы, что Андреш, ведь э, наш товарищ, он рассказывает нам еще незаконченную теорию, которую мы, он просит нас поддержать и понять, и может быть что-то добавить позитивное из того, что мы знаем. Вот, пожалуйста, при э, задавании вопросов и при комментариях, пожалуйста, учитывайте. Чижов, пожалуйста. Uh... Андрес, значит, у меня вот такой вопрос. Согласно вашей теории, квант магнитного потока чему равняется? Вы используете э, тот термин, который уже существует, или при, вы привносите что-то? Нет, это, это вот, интересно, что это другое. So I will ask, uh, I will say first in English the question. So the question was about the magnetic uh, charge quantum. So here, here we да, see да, the... Да, да, да. So here we see the electric charge quantum, the expression that it's, uh, uh, it's related to the 
fine structure constant. And by symmetry between electric and magnetic forces, of course, one would expect that the magnetic charge quantum would be something analogous. But it turns out that it's not. And I had a conference presentation in November that uh, you can look back where I showed physical measurements of the magnetic charge quantum and the physical measurements show that... Поясни, uh, Володь, поясни, пожалуйста, или Валера. Uh, поясни ответ. Он не закончил свой ответ. Uh, okay, okay, maybe I will say also in Russian then. So the magnetic charge quantum for some reason that we don't understand is very different than electric charge quantum. That's what measurements show, but we don't understand yet why. So I try to say in Russian. So да, мы, мы думали бы, что магнитный... Андрес, а? я помогу. Я Хорошо, помогу. давайте, давайте переводить. Володь, да. Володь, это да. сегодня он говорит только про электрический заряд, а магнитный э, поток – это некое превходящее вот на, на текущий момент у него э, это самое квантование. Поэтому он не до конца это понимает. Это правильный вопрос, но сегодня об электрическом заряде. Да, да, но я хочу сказать, что, что о магнитном кванте у меня была презентация в ноябре, когда была конференция э, прошлого года. Э, вы помните? Вот я как раз и задал вопрос. Отличается от тех представлений, которые мы на сегодня... Да, да, делали? отличается. Что и мы, не понимаем, да, мы не понимаем, что почему э, но магнитный квант очень даже отличается от электрического кванта. И мы не понимаем, что, что почему это совсем другая цифра. Это, это интересный вопрос. И не понимаем, почему, потому что было бы логично думать, что какая-то симметрия между электрическими и магнитными силами. Если там симметрия, то симметрия. Думали бы, что, что кванты электрического и магнитного тока тоже симметричны, но почему-то эксперимент показывает, что нет такой симметрии. Так, ответ получен. Но, но ответ 2P получен. на E но, это... Спасибо, ответ получен. Валер, понял, получен. Но 2P на E это непонятно вообще, что это. Но H это... на 2 e понятно, да. Это и сверхпроводимости квант магнитного потока. Ну так он, он, это, он, он из классической физики эту величину взял. Значит, Владимир Бычков. Задает. Да, да, я еще хочу сказать, что natural, natural, units, natural units это система, где H бар единица и C единица тоже. И, и масса. И... Понятно. Да. Понятно. Я выступлю Понятно. потом. Понятно. А, хорошо, Бычков пропускает. Тогда Егоров Евгений задает вопрос. Так, ага, слышите меня, да? Да, слышно. Yeah. Попробуйте по-английски задать. Андрес, а вы калкулируете Гейзенберг на локацию для протон и электрон? Можно я спросить? Калкулировать что? Я не понимаю вопрос. Извините? I didn't understand your question. Can you repeat? Uh, no, there are Geisenberg non-location for quantum particles. Uh, yes. uh, the, yeah, I understand. Uh, the, the Heisenberg. Are you, are you calculate uh, this? Uh... And, Andres, uh, the question is about uh, Heisenberg, uh, oh, Heisenberg relations uh, between uh, between uh, between position and uh, impulse of, of electrons, yes. electricity, uh, energy, and, and, and time. The, the question is about this, Heisenberg yes. relations. Yes, yes, I'm this, not, is, uh, this is something which my, my co-author is calculating. And um, this, is, this is, of course, a very interesting question in physics. Where is it coming from? And where, where does uh, a wave particle duality comes from? Uh, part of the answer is electromagnetic because there is a, a vacuum noise in the background. So the background has the vacuum, even if the vacuum is empty, the vacuum is not empty from electromagnetic noise. There is always some electromagnetic noise, and this plays a role in creating Heisenberg uncertainty. 
but the exact mathematical details uh, they are they are uh, described by my co-author Paul O'Hara, and I think he has very interesting theory about it that uh, that helps us to better understand the meaning of the Dirac equation. Окей, okay. я я по русски скажу, значит, все-таки вот Андрош признал, что он сейчас базируется на пустом физическом вакууме, но понимает, что это на самом деле некое приближение, и вот эти вот неопределенность Гейзенберга, она связана по его мнению, а это совершенно правильное по моему тоже мнению положение, что это связано с осцилляциями, а по сути дела с неоднородностями вакуума. Вот. Но сейчас, вот в сегодняшнем докладе этот вопрос не обсуждается, его поэтому тут и нету. Так, ответ получен. И вот Филипп Васикайло, пожалуйста, Филипп Иванович. Да, я даже не вопрос хотел бы, а как бы рекомендацию, на которую бы... Филипп, тогда выступление чуть позже. Вы, вы... Да нет, там короткая рекомендация, не использовать а, отношение Эйнштейна. И не называть это, так сказать, преобразованием Эйнштейна. Эйнштейн никогда не, преобрез... не преобразовывал массу. Вот пусть он найдет преобразование Эйнштейна. Масса корень квадратный там из единицы минус В квадрат С квадрат. Хорошо, спасибо за рекомендацию. Это And Андрош, Андрош, Филипп, это у него есть целая статья у Филиппа Васикайла на, на эту тему. Там несколько масс э, преобразования, несколько выражений для преобразования массы обнаружил Филипп Иванович Васикайло. Он об этом подробно пишет. Эйнштейн преобразовал пространство, а массу это потом э, приписали различные... Нет, я просто хотел сказать, что надо обратить внимание, что Эйнштейн не делал такого преобразования массы. Он использовал преобразование Лоренца, а Лоренц не массу преобразует, а скорости. И импульс преобразуется, а масса не преобразуется. Хотя в некоторых книжках пишут вот эту формулу. Это ошибка. Это, это хорошее замечание. Спасибо. Спасибо. И я думаю, Андрош это учтет. Ну, в России хорошая школа, мы это видим. Так, так следующий... Ну, вообще, УФН 2-3 года назад и Окунь писал об этом более подробно. Пусть он там ознакомится. С а, я, я думаю, что это ты. Я читал эту статью. Это Окунь писал, верно. Так, Филипп сделал свое замечание. Классное. Так, вот Николай Александрович Магнитский задает. Один из специалистов по теории поля. Вот, аналогично. Можно, да? I have some questions. First, what is a neutron in your model? Oh, the neutron. Neutron. Yes. Neutron. Yes. Well, well, in this uh, in this uh, presentation, I do not uh, deal with the neutron, uh, but in the in the other parts of the book, I actually investigate this question, and I believe that the neutron is an electron-proton uh, composite, so that there is an electron which is uh, very tightly bound to the proton, and that is the neutron, and no, this can be seen. Uh, can you uh, receive a, a magnetic moment of neutron? Uh, yeah, yes. Yeah. So that I actually do some calculations about it, and and the calculations show that when the uh, electrons uh, depart from the neutron, so I use a similar approach, like like is described here, applied to the neutron, and the calculations show that if you take the difference between proton and electron. Then uh, the difference is h bar over two. A structure of neutron must be different. Uh, yes, yes, yes. So, so I, uh, yeah, I describe this. I describe this in the book, and I, I do this type of calculation. And what the calculation shows is that the difference that the neutrino carries away is exactly h bar over two uh, angular momentum. So that the angular momentum of the neutrino that is emitted is exactly h bar over two. Thank you. Uh, second question. Um, is an uh, electron rotating about um, uh, nucleus in your model? Uh, uh, you mean you mean uh, a hydrogen electron or which electron? 
No, in uh, nuclear, electron is rotating about the nucleus. Ah, you mean, you mean in the neutron? Around. 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 The size of uh, no, your electron? Atoms. The question is about atoms. Atoms, normal atoms. Hydrogen, for example. Right. Hydrogen. Okay. Inside, inside atom. Yeah, yeah, okay, okay. So this is in the, yeah, this is another very interesting question that um, uh, if we go back to the very first slide it's here, so that the radius um, of your electron is uh, uh, significantly uh, more than the radius of proton. Uh, it's uh, right, I think, uh, but is the electron rotating? Yeah. So if you take a hydrogen, if you take, for example, a hydrogen in the ground state, the ground state is one s orbital. So is the electron rotating in the ground state one s orbital or not? And uh, uh, this is a very interesting question because. Uh, in, in my in our description, yes, the electron is uh, rotating in the one s orbital around the. Uh, no. No, the situation is uh, uh, has an electron uh, orbit or orbital. Or, or, yes. Or uh, there are no orbit and orbitali and, and orbitali in uh, atom. Uh, yeah, yeah, there are there are, of course there are these orbits, you know, one s, two s, one p, so forth. So the Dirac, you know, the Dirac solution. Uh, gives the eigen uh, states and the Dirac eigen states are the electron orbitals. So, so of course the Dirac equation is used uh, the way it's normally used. The question is about the interpretation, because this is a very interesting question. That if you look at the ground state orbital one s, it's spherically symmetric. So that physicists think that because it's spherically symmetric, it's the same everywhere. They think that one um, uh, s orbital is a radial oscillation. <laughs> But uh, but uh, if we say that okay, it's not a radial oscillation, then how can it be spherically symmetric and still have an orbital oscillation? And I was thinking about this question, and my uh, my proposition is that one has to realize that in the end the electron is orbiting not the nucleus but the center of mass, so that the electron and the nucleus they both orbit around the center of mass. And, uh, and the question is, how are these two orbits coupled to give a spherically symmetric electron orbital? And we describe the mathematics of this in the book that how can you have a, a spherically symmetric uh, electron orbital and still an angular momentum? And I think the answer is related to, uh, to realizing that both nucleus and electron rotate around the common center of mass and you have to look statistically how these two rotations are coupled. And the, the uh, last question. Um, you uh, have many formulae, uh, but um, there is no physical uh, sense and, uh, in um, uh, your model. Uh, okay. What is the sense of um, electron, of proton, of neutron, of uh, um, potential? Uh, uh, vector potential and uh, many others. Well, the, the, the vector potential is, is the physical the, sense. No, yeah, you have uh, no um, environment uh, continuous medium in your model. You have a vacuum, but uh, yes. there is no physical essence for your um, uh, I should, your quantities and your. Uh, uh, I think that this is a, it's a little bit philosophical measures. question. Because, because your question is, can we define a vector potential field in vacuum? Yes. Or does there have to be something in the from vacuum? What, from what is vector potential? Yeah, yeah, but this is, I think to me, it's a physical, it's a philosophical question because what you're asking that can we say that in a vacuum, we define a vector potential field or does there have to be some material in the vacuum or some entity in the vacuum, which creates this vector potential field? But to me, it's philosophy because you can either say that you define a vector potential field in the vacuum, or you can say that there is some material which we don't yet understand, and this material we don't yet understand, it creates the, the vector potential. Uh, to me, this is a bit philosophy because the main point is that, that uh, physical uh, reality that we can experiment and measure and calculate is the vector potential. That's to me, that's the, the physical part. 
Андрей Александрович, да. ответ получен. Вот Николай, он, он уже отвечал на этот вопрос. У Но него это... в его модели, в его модели векторный потенциал просто спущен Богом Но... на, на, на наше пространство. Но этот вопрос не только к векторному потенциалу, это вообще Тогда... все. И поля электромагнитные. Он, он, он так его создавать. понимает. Давай сейчас дискуссию. Вот он так ответил на твой вопрос. Да, хорошо. А, да. Анатолий, Анатолий Климов задает вопрос. Андрюш, вот concerning this slide, and everybody knows that there are two radius of electron radius. The first is the classical two. Point eight two femtometers, and another called Compton radius electron is three hundred eighty six and dot one six femtometers. My question for for you. Uh, uh, what the electrical uh, electrical um, energy in the uh, Compton radius? Not uh, the classical radius, but Compton radius. Electrical power, electrical uh, energy, electrical energy. Well, well, the two, the relationship between two is is alpha, the fine structure constant. So, because if you want to if you want to integrate only until Compton radius. Uh, then, uh, then your answer will be alpha times less than this. Yes, yes, yes. Uh, it's uh, uh, so. We have uh, about three point seventy three kilo electron volts. Yes, yes, exactly, exactly. And namely in this radius, according to my opinion and knowledge of the uh, uh, energy of magnetic fields and electrical fields is equal. It's a uh, uh, well-known result. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, well, I think this I is really, I think, I think have... your, your theory is, is related to, to this theory. It's, uh, but, it's very but, much related. But, but according to your estimation, uh, 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 magnetic uh, energy in the uh, Compton radius is uh, 255 uh, uh, no, 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 the, no, this is a total. Sorry, this is a total magnetic energy, and and the quantum radius defines this oscillation, uh, the circulation radius of the charge, but the calculation is the is the total magnetic energy, and uh, and I think you are right that if you look at a restricted part of space, you again find the two being equal but smaller because you look only at part part of the space, not the not the total. So in in both cases, this is total electric energy and this is total magnetic energy. Uh, phi, what means phi? Uh, in, it's a flux, uh, flux, flux, magnetic flux. Magnetic flux, and E? It is the charge. Charge. Uh, current, current, so that's charge, current, electric current. It's current, current. Uh, Andres, may, 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 may I help you? Толь, вот смотри, как он считает. Вот в его модели он... Ну, я понял, что он понимает. Электрон, электрон, электрон. Послушай меня. В его модели электрон создает два тока. Один телеток по орбите, а второй ток собственный. Вот когда он эти оба тока просуммирует, у него получается вот этот флакс, который он пишет, поток. И вот и поэтому получается это выражение. Вот если ты два этих движения сложишь, и это правильные, в принципе, действия. Вот. Ну, классические, они классические, они не квантовые. Да, да, что... да, да, да нет, но все, все так и делают. Значит, по определению магнитного поля это и умножено на площадь этого витка. Если ты сделаешь, то магнитное поле он, будет... Он, 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 отсюда, он отсюда и нашел. На Комптоне точности будет равно электрическому. Да, и он это, он это применил. Ответ получен. Нет, а у него получилось на самом деле, что вот он МЦ квадрат разбил на две. Вот половина из, из них лишь э, в электрическом поле сидит, а половина сидит в, в магнитном. И тогда... Это, это, это обсуждение. Это его модель. Это обсуждение. Ты вопрос и, задал. И, и тогда мы, мы Масса электрона, она по сути дела электромагнитная, понимаешь? А что держит ее? Ну, ну это, это, это очень хороший вопрос, что держит массу. И я думаю, что это сам тот же самый вопрос, как квант, квантовая магнитного 
uh, electricity of Zariada. Uh, why? Uh, so it's the same question like electric charge uh, quantum. And I think that uh, uh, to, to answer this question, you, you need to use a relativistic calculation with a curved space. And, and we, have, we have some ideas in the book about this. So if you look at the book, we have some ideas that, uh, that relate to the electron stability to answer why is it stable. Uh, Andres, uh, so uh, according to my opinion, your, your approach is not uh, uh, total. It is not- uh, uh, Consistent. Uh, consistent, uh, yes, well, uh, thank you very much. <laughs> Totally is not totally consistent. Okay. Yes. So 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 I would say that our approach in that sense is consistent. That we use uh, Maxwell's equations consistently. No, no, you don't um, know where Maxwell's equations are taken from. Uh, well, well, that's uh, that's uh, that's the other question that you you were you were asking whether whether in reality there is a, a scalar field or not. So of course we start with this assumption. That the scalar field describes charges. So with, so, with, with this starting point, from this starting point, we used it consistently. But that's a matter of discussion whether this is the correct starting point or not a correct starting point. And, 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 and in terms of uh, total, uh, you know, I would like again to emphasize that uh, I would say that the next step, next step, is to be able to calculate alpha or e or or magnetic flux. So if we can if we can calculate why alpha is 137, of course that will complete the theory, and that's an interesting next challenge and probably a Nobel Prize challenge to calculate this. Okay, Chepilev задает вопрос. Volod, Volod, включи микрофон. У тебя микрофон не включен. Volod, Chepilev. Включи микрофон. Oh, excuse me. Uh, I have a question about uh, one paper. Uh, may I show my screen? Yeah, yes, yes, please. Uh, stop. Uh, one okay. minute. Uh, this paper. Uh, do you familiar with this paper? No, no I never heard uh, of it. By John Wheeler. Uh, it is rather old paper, you see. Uh, uh, one nine uh, fifty four. Fifty and very old. Okay. Very yeah. old paper. Very old. Uh, you may see. Uh, may, maybe it is an interesting uh, electron model. Uh, you may find uh, something like this. Uh, some torus uh, particles uh, in this model are described like um, a standing uh, wave uh, uh, in a tor, something like this. M maybe it is interesting for you. Yes. Yes. Thank you for the suggestion. Yeah, it uh, will be interesting to look at it because, of course, the topology is quite uh, similar. Okay. Thank you. Okay, Savchenko задает вопрос. Andrush, can uh, could you precise uh, uh, the issue uh, between uh, high frequency neutrinos and low frequency neutrinos? Uh, if I clearly understood, high frequency frequency uh, neutrinos has uh, higher energy and uh, hence uh, higher mass and uh, low frequency neutrinos, uh, low energy and uh, lower mass. No, and, no, I would not say about the mass. Uh, no, uh, and if we move to the uh, next slide uh, where you show better decay, uh, you see uh, uh, the difference of kinetic uh, uh, energy uh, that uh, proposed by uh, neutrinos. This is yeah, let me let me go there. 
So, so yeah. So here, here, here you can see the neutrino energy. Yes, but I yes. would. It's it's well known. Yes, it's a well known graphic. But if the mass of neutrinos uh, is uh, different, a uh, low frequency and high frequency, and the uh, velocity is the same, does it mean that uh, in this uh, decay participated all kinds of neutrinos? No, no, well, I would firstly, uh, I would not talk about neutrino mass, only about an, an, an energy, because I see neutrinos very much as analogs to photons. And uh, we don't talk about photon mass, uh, even we just talk about photon energy. And I think this is very we much- We talk the, about photon uh, mass and uh, photon mass, you know, uh, have uh, the moment. Uh, yeah, we, we talk about energy and momentum. So I think that this is the same here that we should talk about uh, energy and momentum of neutrinos, but not about the mass. This is my opinion. Okay. Не, не, о массе, не о массах говорит, а об энергиях. И это правильно. Это релятивистский подход. Так, ну, Чепик задавал, да. Сашенко задавал. Панчелюга задает вопрос. Андреш, uh, 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 in your approach, some electrodynamical systems can uh, serve like a neutrino generator. Uh, it's correct? Uh, yes, yes. I, I think that uh, this is correct, so that once you uh, once you understand uh, this uh, this equation, you can think, you know, how to how to generate this kind of waves. Okay. Uh, the second question is, uh, can you specify uh, uh, such electrodynamical system? Uh, have you some ideas? Uh, um, no, no. Unfortunately, not yet. So this is, you know, this is the beginning of this work, and I, I think that probably uh, Alexander Parkhomov has more ideas because he has written a book on this topic, so he, he probably has more ideas on this. Yeah, I want to ask you, if you use uh, the equation for energy, electric energy, you use it only, uh, not uh, what, uh, energy, you use E uh, epsilon E squared divided by two. And where you uh, forget B, mu, B squared divided by two, and where do you, you uh, hide the pointing ve vector in this case? So you, if you consider the, uh, the derivation of this uh, equation, you can uh, obtain it from Maxwellian equations where you will have this uh, energy plus uh, integrated over the volume magnetic energy integrated over the volume and it will be uh, equal to the flow of uh, uh, pointing vector where did you uh, why you can separate b e and pointing vector yeah they are, they are not separated they are inducing each other so, okay. so this, this expression that i have on the bottom this so one you, 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 you cannot do it you cannot do it you Sorry. cannot do it because you you, you use uh, this equation for energy. So you have to use here the addition of magnetic field. So uh, you no, cannot this, this, no, no. If you calculate if you calculate one half b squared, you get the same result. If you calculate b squared over two, is the same result as this uh, formula. And where, but you can separate here. You can and, consider uh, have, on the fact, on the, the sum. Look, in fact, if we stop, have stop stop stop, you cannot separate them. From the Maxwellian equations, you cannot separate them. It yeah. is some sort of approximation. If you have magnetic field, then you have uh, to use uh, the sum of it. That is. So I obtained answer. No, 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 no. Yes, yes. I think I think that this this is the correct that this is the stationary solution. And we have, in, in fact, we have two types of uh, derivation. And then stationary. And my claim, yeah, so my claim is that uh, uh, in the B squared over two in the stationary case is the, the same. The stationary as case one. is the same. You cannot separate. Please yes, look how it is derivated. 
у него, можно я скажу, у него очень интересная, но ну, она такая понятная система, при которой электрическое и магнитное поле перпендикулярны друг другу. Поэтому то, что ты, то о чем ты думаешь, что они должны как-то друг на друга влиять, они при скалярном произведении просто это самое, не, не перемножаются, потому что произведение скалярное равно нулю в этом случае, и поэтому остаются раздельные. Поэтому он разделяет электрическую энергию и магнитную разделяет. Так они неправильно говоришь. Ну, это, у тебя ну, это... ну, а, квадрат а, плюс а, 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 квадрат. Sorry, sorry. Их разделять sorry, нельзя. Валерий is right, and you have to remember that this moves at the speed of light. So this is not, this is not any speed. This moves at the speed of light, and because of this light speed movement, you have uh, these separate expressions. So Valerie, Я хочу is... сказать следующее, что из формул, которые получаются из уравнения Максвелла, нельзя говорить о том, что одно перпендикулярно, другое параллельно, потому что у вас епсилен е в квадрате, и мю е в квадрате, и мю аж в квадрате, и здесь разделять ничего нельзя. We actually derive this um, uh, electron energy with two different approaches. This is the first approach that's more easy to understand, but we also derive it with a different approach with the Lagrangian current. And uh, with, with, a, with a different approach, we calculate from the Lagrangian current density, what is the energy density, And if you take the Lagrangian approach, you also get the same. Don't frighten me with Lagrangian approach. Please sit on the classical position. And please explain me how you can the classical well, the, the uh, two are equivalent because well, well, you can have a Lagrangian formulation of Maxwell's equations and the two Andres, are Andres, Andres and Bichkov. Давайте мы прекратим эту сейчас дискуссию. Это мы спрашиваем. Я спросил. Мы часа заседаем. Друзья, Давайте вопросы, потому что он как-то ответил на вопрос Бычкова. Теперь давайте попробуем высказаться. Но э, э, у меня просьба, ну как-то сжато, не, рас, не растекаясь мыслью по древу, потому что попробуем в течение пяти минут, не более, каждый выскажется. Вот я вижу, Климов поднял руку. Пожалуйста, Анатолий. Андрош, я, я попробую по-русски, но я думаю, ты меня поймет. Значит, ну, твой подход, и не, не, не твой, а твоих коллег, это я давно слежу за вами, он интересный подход, так сказать, особенно вот, вот использование вот этого, так сказать, вращающегося электрона, значит, с челами, когда вы там делали. Он впечатляет, и я думаю, он имеет какое-то будущее. Значит, единственное, что мне значит, вот хотелось бы тебе посоветовать, значит, все-таки, значит, вот там, конечно, ты определять можешь все, что угодно, как угодно, но вот когда ты вводишь связь между пространственной координатой и производной, так сказать, по времени, и производной по пространству, значит, через С, то есть вот dx равняется c на dt. Но да. это уже ты сразу жестко ограничиваешь всю вот эту алгебру свою, так сказать, которая позволяет больше, намного больше, так сказать, вам шагнуть вперед. Это вот первое. Значит, второе, ну вот посмотри, там у тебя есть разложение скорости света на две компоненты, так сказать. Ну, если вы уже заложили, что о, 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 вот это вот правильно. Значит, если же вы уже заложили, что у вас есть скорость света, так сказать, ну, это аналог скорости звука, так сказать, она, то вы ее, значит, вот, ну, как бы ты ее не раскладывал, так сказать, вот на, на, на две компоненты, значит, звук есть и свет, есть свет. Он во, всех, во все стороны имеет, будет распространяться, так сказать, ну, да. Гюгенса Фринеля, со скоростью света. Его да. на две компоненты, так сказать, ну, мне кажется, здесь надо как-то вот это поаккуратнее сделать, так сказать, вот здесь какие-то ну, ляпы явно, так сказать, просматривать. Тем более вы не рассмотрели случай, ну, а если будет навстречу или там поперек этого электрона дуть вот эфир, ветер, значит, ну, и что тогда, какой -то доплер получится, если будет вот навстречу этому вот образованию, так сказать, или вдоль него... Дуть ветер, поток эфира. 
Поэтому, значит, наиболее интересно, мне кажется, то, что ты, значит, вот вышел на нейтрино и действительно за эти, над этим надо еще подумать, так сказать. Ну, наверное, это в письменной переписке каждый сформулирует свои вопросы. Она затронула больше всех, наверное, интерес у присутствующих, потому что, ну, значит, идея свежая, хорошая, мне кажется, так сказать, ее надо пообсуждать поподробнее. Спасибо, спасибо, спасибо за комментарии. И, конечно, это очень большой вопрос, что все это э, всегда э, постоянная или не постоянная. Это, это, конечно, большой э, открытый вопрос. Андрош, Андрош, ты еще ответил. Ты еще, я тебе дам слово. Владимир Львович хочет сказать что-то. Я хочу сказать следующее, что как бы сказать, извините, что по-русски буду говорить, что у вас не самосогласованная постановка. Вы пытаетесь получить данные об нейтрино и не знаете, что из чего у вас состоит ваша вся эта среда. Вы никаких вопросов, никаких ограничений на существование физического вакуума не ставите, не рассматриваете, как в нем распространяется электромагнитная волна в физическом вакууме. У вас вопросов даже этого не стоит. Вы привязываетесь к, вторе, к прошлому веку, к формулам Эйнштейна и не, не понимаете, что в ваших, в ваших условиях может быть скорость света больше, чем э, э, скорости могут быть больше, чем скорости света. И это никто вас не, не ограничивает, потому что у вас уравнение Максвелла. Ну да, мы... ну да, это я понимаю, что это тот же самый коммент, то, что Криму задал. И это, конечно, можно более э, продумать дальше эту теорию. Э, и можно продумать, что, потому что... Э, что, что будет, если все не постоянно. Это... Все не постоянно, тогда возникает вопрос, что вы понимаете под электрической проницаемостью для вашей среды. Это принципиально, если вы разделяете скорость света и э, диэлектрическую проницаемость. Далее, у вас сразу возникает вопрос, что за волны у вас двигаются в физическом вакууме? Что они такое? Что они переносят? Почему вы имеете право пользоваться уравнениями, ну, если вы их пишете? Ну, ну, для, меня, для меня это более философический вопрос, потому что меня более интересует э, то, что можно... Э, понять э, в смысле эксперимента. То, что можно а, ну, на самом понять, деле, извините, когда вы говорите в эксперименте, есть Е квадрат плюс h квадрат, то она нигде в эксперименте не проверялась в целом. Она проверялась через только вектор умового поинтига. У вас половина вещей, они не проверены в эксперименте. Так что я понимаю, что вам очень хочется получить современный результат, но вы абсолютно забываете не субстрат, а основание, на чем вы это строите. У вас она получается тогда эклектическая очень задача. Вот здесь я использую уравнение Эйнштейна, здесь я использую уравнение, грубо говоря, Шрёдингера, здесь я использую соотношение Дебройля. А как они следуют из Нет, нет, это немного, немного по-другому, потому что наш принцип, что мы не используем эти уравнения, наш принцип, что мы используем Uh, уравнение Максвелла и уравнение релятивизма, uh, general relativity. И uh, we, we, derive, we derive everything from general relativity and Maxwell equation. Uh, so we are not using uh, other, other type of ideas. Uh, общая uh, теория uh, относительности, она же имеет здесь дело, имеет здесь, если вы исходите из уравнений Максвелла. Uh, Где uh, там uh, усилит uh, релятивизм? Uh, Андрес, you, you will have a flow to, 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 to give an answer. Олег, продолжай или завершай. Я хочу сказать, что для Андреша нужно посмотреть над формулировкой базисной. Может быть, и не нужно ему использовать соотношение релятивизма. Они ему совсем не нужны, они его ограничивают. Вот в чем Это дело. Хороший есть... совет. Окей, Бычков, Бычков Я сказал, толковым, да. толковым замечанием правильным. И если позволите, я тоже несколько слов скажу и будем завершать нашу суперинтересную. Кстати, у нас сегодня было почти 40 человек в сумме. Так вот, ну я попробую коротко. Во-первых, мне очень понравилась алгебра Клиффорда. Ну она, кстати, 
Она такая вот, один из, из видов только ал, алгебр, который тут используется многими людьми уже многие годы. Вот. И я все-таки познакомлюсь поближе с этим, поэтому если можно, Андрош, пришли мне, пожалуйста, свою книгу, я тебе деньги готов выслать за нее. Хорошо. Но я хочу... Но, нет, это не джок, я могу платить. И, но некое все-таки негативные соображения тоже выскажу, критические, можно сказать. Так? Дело в том, что... А, нет, вот то, что еще понравилось. Вот он распространил действия своего, своей теории на все масштабы. Вот это тоже очень важная позиция в его, в его подходе, в их подходе. Но мне кажется, вот на размерах уже... Внутри электрона, где ты полагаешь, что электромагнитного поля нет, вот этот подход уже не работает. И я даже знаю почему. Потому что на самом деле ты, вот этот вакуум у тебя пустой, а вот если бы ты его заполнил, как вот тебя Климов призывает, да и Бычков, по сути дела, к этому призывает, заполнил этот вакуум чем-то, пусть для начала я его называю вот вот этот начальный вакуум, я его называю реликтовый вакуум, реликтовый вакуум, то, то ты, бы тогда, ты бы тогда там получил, что и скорость света у тебя там менялась бы, то, что вот Бычков получает, и многие другие чудеса, и в том числе поле не нулевое внутри электрона. Но вот по твоей модели, если вернуться вот к тому фрейму, который ты имеешь, мне кажется очень существенным, что ты почему-то не используешь запаздывающие потенциалы. Хотя это очевидная вещь. Вот этот самый Фейнман, вот аналогичные расчеты по электрону, то, что и ты на орбитале, хотя, кстати, не орбитали, а орбиты. Мы в русском языке различаем. Орбитали – это квантовая такая физика, а орбиты, о которых ты говоришь, это Физика классическая. Так вот, Фейнман в классической, собственно, подходе, по аналогичному твою, использует Ленара Вихерта. А ты, ты об этом знаешь, естественно, я же вижу, но почему-то не используешь, не используешь. Но в целом работа очень симпатичная, очень мне нравится, и это, безусловно, некий шажок вперед. Я согласен, Климов, по-моему, об этом говорил, в особенно, что ты подтянул то, что нейтрино – это из-за спин. Это теория из-за спина. Вот это очень здорово. Друзья, я надеюсь, думаю, что замечаний больше нет, хотя у нас тут несколько очень грамотных людей присутствуют, в том числе, вот, например, Булыженков. Он там где-то помалкивает, ни вопросов, ничего не задавал. Вот. Ну, в основном все вроде бы так вот высказались. Поэтому позвольте мне на этом завершить очень удачное настоящее физическое обсуждение на нашем вебинаре. В следующий раз мы встретимся через неделю. Будет выступать Чижов Владимир с очень интересным докладом по работе никель-водородного реактора при комнатной температуре. Не при 1000 градусов, а при комнатной температуре. Посмотрим, как он это докажет и как он это экспериментально исследует. На этом Заканчиваем сегодняшний семинар. Спасибо всем за участие. Спасибо. Спасибо. До свидания. Спасибо.